As I took a one, we start from this one. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. We thank you for this moment that you have given to us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Not me, but you. Speak through us, O oh Lord. For who, are, who, who is mortal man that you are so mindful of him? We are your children gathered tonight. Let your, your, your own word be heard in our midst. Holy Spirit, come take, take hold of my mind, of my tongue, of my spirit, of my soul. That, Father, you will speak to us. As your children, we open our heart to receive from you. Humbly, we lay our all before you. And we say, Lord, come and take full preeminence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So I will be reading from the Lord. It says, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I read children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his masters, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you carry, go back, verse five, verse five. He said, why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in the rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burn with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty has left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitudes of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, and convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. Go back one step. Thank you. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Amen. 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 This is the word of the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. 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 When I first read the first lines of this Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, my heart went to the Lord. And I said, whoa. Is that the way God is feeling toward us when we sin against him? If we go to verse 2, he says, Hear, O heaven, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I read children 
and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. How sad is that? That God, the creator of heaven and earth, will do everything for us. He will give us life, the bread of life, and yet we rebel against him. Is that the way we should repay God? It brought sadness to my heart. Go to verse 3, for, uh, please. He said, the ox knows his master, the donkey is owner's major, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Is that the way we should repay God? Somebody may ask me, what have I done? I haven't done anything. But why will the Lord feel so sad that he has brought up children, that we should bring joy to him, we should bring honor to him, and all we are bringing back is sadness. When he look at us, and he's wondering, what have I done? That I will create these beautiful people, and the only thing they will have to repay me is for me to have a heart that is broken. So tonight my call is that each one of us will analyze our own life. Nobody is going to point the finger at anybody. All of us know ourselves. We know where we are fallen short of the glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The desire of God is not that any man should perish. He said even though our sins are deep, red as scarlet, he's ready to forgive us. But for him to forgive us, we need to come to the understanding that we have wronged him. The year is still young. This is the beginning of the year. We are only in February. We can still amend our way. Mm -hmm. It's not too late. All of us can still change our mind, repent from our sinful ways, and begin to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. God is not a father that will kill us. He's ready to receive each one of us if only we could understand where we have fallen short of his glory and begin to repent and do what is right and seek his face with sincerity of heart. It is not his desire that he will bring us up and when we are yet wrapped to give him glory, we will turn around and begin to bring sorrow to his soul. That shall not be our portion. It shall not be us. This is New Year. We should be counted among the people who say, if there is nobody else on earth that will bring glory to God, God should find me. Amen. 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 If there is nobody left on this earth to bring joy to the heart of the Father, I want to be the one that will bring glory and joy to his heart. Amen. This is the decision that each one of us should make. Not following the crowd, because people are going right, all of us follow and go right. If people are going left, all of us follow and go left. Because they are doing this new fashion, we too join in and follow them. Because they are misbehaving in their classroom, in their school, they don't respect teachers, they shout, they do all manners of things. We too, from the moment we leave the house of our parents, we join them, we become like them. And we behave even worse than those who know the Lord. He says he has brought us up. He has cared for us. He has nurtured us. I will, I will own should not be to be numbered among the people who bring sorrow to his heart. But we should be the people who decide. Like in the days of Daniel and his friends, they decided not to defy themselves with the food of the king. Like in the days of Joseph, when the wife of Potiphar was tempting him, he said, for me to do that and bring shame to the name of the Lord, never! And he preferred to throw his cloth and to run out. He was accused. He was put into jail wrongfully. And yet, the Lord who is faithful was able to pick him up and to raise him to the position of prime minister of that country. Amen. Today, in this generation, God is waiting on you, 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 and each one of us to take our stand in this generation and say, Lord, I'm sorry for all the time I brought sorrow to your, to your heart. Mm -hmm. From now on, I want to be the best me. The best me ever. Hallelujah. I want to be the best me ever. If I've never knew who I was before, from now on I know who I am. Yes. And I want to bring glory and joy to your name. Mm -hmm. When you look down on earth, I want you to look at me and be proud of me. Like in the time when God turned and said to Satan, have you considered Job my servant? Job decided to distinguish himself. Hallelujah. Amen. All the good friends of Jesus 
all the good friends of God. In the days of Enoch, he pleased God, even though people were doing evil. In the days of Abraham, he stood out. Hallelujah! Yeah. We want to be this kind of people again. That God will look down on all the earth and he will spot Birmingham, that little town. And within that little town, Birmingham, he will spot each one of our homes. He will spot our church, a small church, and yet a people ready for the Lord. A people that have decided to single themselves out. Hallelujah! Yeah. To bring him glory. We want to be part of these people. That the, the day of the blast of the trumpet, none of us will be found wanting. But we all make it to heaven. All old and young, children and adults alike. All of us, people from every tongue, every tribe, every race, all of us will make it to heaven. This is our final destination. May the Lord bless his word to that. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I thought you would give glory to God for Pastor Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. To ride on what she has uh, led us into, the Lord has used her to bless us with. Mm -hmm. You know, what I know uh, about God, the half obedience is not obedience. You know, some people come to church, but they have half obedience. I don't know if you understand what I mean by half obedience. God is after full obedience, Amen. not half. Because if you beg God half, it like God say to you, that uh, what example would the Holy Spirit give to me to explain what I'm trying to say to you if God said to you do not lie okay and then you learn some ways from the word that are, for this type of issues problems I can lie but these ones I cannot lie I hope you understand that <clears throat> So you know that some, uh, some issues you have to lie, but some you don't have to lie. That's not obedience. It's half obedience. Praise God. Do we understand what I'm saying? Yeah, when you approach things half-half, you are, you are not obedient. You know, in our country, we used to have a cabinet minister who used to say, if you have one leg in, one leg out is out. So it's the same thing, isn't it? So, riding on what my pastor is saying, you know, when you read the, the word of God more and more, you will understand that God has feelings. I hope you understand that. When somebody is saying that, look at the children that I raised. I raised them, I fed them, I gave them everything. They have grown to this level. Now, that I should rejoice in them, they have rebelled against me. That speaks, is an expression of somebody who is very disappointed at his work. Not because of him, but because of the people he trusted. So we can disappoint God. You know, we can disappoint him. God can invest in us, and that's what he does when we are born. You know, he's assigned us parents, places we are to go, and schools that we are to go. All the investment that we receive in life is God. He used our parents to coach us, but he's the one that gives life. You will know that some of the children that you were born with, some have died, they have gone, even when you were young. But he kept you alive. He kept you alive up to now, you know, so that you may be useful for him. But despite all this, when we grow to a level where he, can, he should normally depend on us to help others, now we dis we're disappointed. So God has feelings. In the same way somebody will disappoint you and you feel, that's how God feels. But his own is holy. So in, in, in other words, his own is much more deeper. That's why, you know, one thing that the apostle said to us, he teaches us, he teaches us something. He said, as higher as the mercy of God is, as higher as his love is, or as deep as his love is, so also deep is his wrath. That's why people go to hell and don't come back again forever. You know, in as much as it's good, and he's full of love. His love is very, very profound and deep. So when he's angry, his, his, anger, his, his, his anger is very deep. Because the understanding of God is more profound that you can do something and for you it doesn't mean anything. I hope you understand that. But God understands your motive and even far beyond what you can think of. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Is God talking to us tonight? Amen. You know, God prefers people that are obedient to Him, that people that jam, jam, make a noise, jump everywhere, and, you know, they are not obedient. He is not pleased with such assembly. A church can be very small. You know, a man of God that is going to be with the Lord now, uh, 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 Pastor Kenneth Hagen, peace be unto his soul, is being to be with the Lord. He said there was a time when his ministry began to go high. You know, churches began to write to him. And the church called him that he should go to them. He should come to them. And the church was a very small church. And then another big church has called him. So he was thinking that probably he loved to go to the small church to be a blessing to them. But at the same time, you know, the big church, they have more uh, administration. They have secretary that will call and, uh, you know, to make sure they remind him of the invitation. And so he said, ah, I prefer to go to the big church. But then God spoke to him. God spoke to him that go to that small church. And then God explained to him why. He said, a big church, I will go and preach there. They will give me a big offering, love offering, bless me, and so on. But a small church, they don't even have that. You know? I probably will have to give it to them again on top of my preaching. And he said, God said, go there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because the way they were working with the Lord, the effort they were making was pleasing to God. But there was a gift that was not working there. Because they needed somebody to come and impart it to them. So God was watching over them. the big church, God said, don't go there. So not every big church that you see that God is there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Sometimes a church can be very small. But the Lord is there. Amen. 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 Their praise and worship is more pleasing to God than the big church. And some big churches are pleasing to the Lord too. Amen. I know our church, CFT, we are pleasing, we are walking in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't have any doubt at all. Our spiritual father has not changed. I've served under him for over 20 years. The man hasn't changed. He's walking with the Lord. His joy for God is the same. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so we rejoice in the Lord our God. I want to... To, I've been writing on what my pastor has preached to us. I want to take us quickly into uh, a choice that we need to make in order to have peace in our mind. Amen? Things that will help us to serve God better. So let us go quickly to the book of Matthew chapter 6. From verse 24, please. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 24. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Lord, we appreciate you for your love and your care. Indeed, who can lead such a great people of the Lord? Solomon said to you, who can speak the word of God accurately? I depend on you. I ask you to use my mind and my heart, O oh Lord, and to speak to us. That the end of it, your name, O oh Father, may be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. The word of the Lord said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will, devoted, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, one thing I study about Jesus Christ our Lord over and over again is the word of the Lord are always true to the letter. Everything that Jesus says or he said when he was teaching and he said because he's alive. Everything that is written in the Bible, they are true to the letter. If Jesus said you cannot, you cannot is not negotiable. In other words, there's no middle ground in this. How do you understand that? You cannot serve God and money. He said you cannot. Praise God. Does it mean that we don't need money to live? We do. But he's teaching us where to put our heart and our mind. That is what it's all about here. Praise God. Praise God. So, how do you know before we go into the rest of the world? How do you know that money is the God of someone, of a Christian? I'm talking about the church. 
How do you know that someone come to church by money is, is God and not the God of Abraham? If you look at yourself and whenever your joy is great, whenever you are so happy it's because it's the end of a month you have been paid. Praise God. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> the end of a month will bring everybody happy because a, a laborer, a laborer deserves his wages, isn't it? Amen. So yes, everybody will be happy at the end of a month. Amen. When I went to the Ivory Coast, uh, there was something that was told me, was, was, explained, was explained to me, said that you will see at the end of a month, you see many cars outside. There will be more traffic. I said, ah, how? And they told me that no, because people have been paid. And I said, ah, what is the correlation between the car and the, the end of a month? And they said, oh, no, here, when people don't have money, they pay their cars. By the end of a month, when they are paid, yes, then everybody is a boss. They now bring their cars, they wash it and bring it out. And they run for seven days. <laughs> For seven days, they run the cars and they park it again. <laughs> it's just to show that they have car. Okay? So, you know, yes, everybody will be happy whenever you are paid. Whether you are a believer or not, you'll be happy. That doesn't mean that money is your goal. But I'm talking about when your joy is mainly determined by whatever you have. Well, in money when you are paid or you become very moody when there's no money in your account. Nobody knows but you know. And for that week throughout, you don't laugh. Your, your heart is, your inside is tense. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Inside of you completely tense because you look at your account, there's no money and they'll pay you maybe next week but now you don't have it. It's not really there. But you have the, the, the baseline or the minimum to live, there's no problem. You know, because God will supply all your needs. So you see that you have money to eat, you have everything. But because you don't have that security that comes from money, that extra that gives to your mind security, because you don't have that, it changes your mood. You know, brethren, at that stage you know that God is, there's a dispute inside of you between God and money. In other words, God is not really your God. It's your God when you are on the mountain. But it's not your God when you are in the valley. Praise God. I believe God is talking to us. He said you cannot serve both God and money. How do you know a believer who has matured? A believer who has matured is someone who is happy regardless of what they have. Because everybody that lives under the sun, if you have reached the age of, I believe, 15 onwards to 20, 25, you would have seen, even if you don't know, or your parents have not told you, you would have seen the goodness of God somewhere in your life. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm using 15 because 12, sometimes God do good to people, but God does good, but people don't know even it's God. Have you understand? By the age of 15, 16, you are beginning to reason more. So you could see that God has helped you. Now, if you are rich, 20, 25, 30, 35, you have children and so on, you will know the time when you and your husband, even to have money to eat in the house, it was a tough. The children don't know, but you are, the two of you, you know. All right? You went through all these things. So God gave us, he gives us experience in life. He takes us through experiences so that we will have an account of him. And those accounts are the one that will be our reliance Hallelujah. in the days of dryness. Hallelujah. And that is when Israel failed. Israel failed because they did not re realize that they have an account in their favor to demonstrate that indeed God is a God of provision. Praise God. Hallelujah. That is why they did not enter Canaan. Because they have an account that God has given them. He gave them experience in Goshen before even they left. Alright? Before they left Egypt, when the plagues were hitting everybody, 
The Bible says Goshen was protected. So everybody in Egypt received 11 plagues, but Israelites did not receive any, even a single, nothing. They were protected in Goshen before even they left. Okay? When they left, and they walk, God opened the Red Sea for them. Before the Red Sea, the army that they were so afraid of, the angel of the, of the Lord moved back from the front and blocked the whole army of Egyptians. Thousands of soldiers, hundreds of chariots. He blocked them. He gave them darkness and light to the, the, the children of Israel. They walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They arrived. They received manna from heaven every day they ate. That account was to demonstrate that I am with you. Besides, they could see with their own naked eyes the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God himself was dwelling with them. So they had a very vivid and real account of the power and the goodness of God. That is why God said that as surely as I live, and God cannot swear by anybody else. Because there's nobody greater than God. He said, I have sworn by my name as long as I, as, as long as I live. He said, these ones who have tested me, they have seen my glory, and tested me ten times. They didn't know God was counting. He said, they tested me ten times. Not one of them who has seen my glory and despised me will enter the land of promise. As surely as their mouth have declared that they should have died in this desert, it says, so shall you be. This is dangerous. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brethren, we cannot serve God and money. It's not possible. I have lived as a minister of God. I don't live under a, uh, as a minister who have a regular monthly salary for ministry, no. So I have gone through time when I don't have a job. I've gone through time where I have no money at all, even as a minister, for years. I have seen that your peace and your joy cannot come from when you have money. Because there are times when you have money and it's going well for you. And then there's time when your condition changes and you don't have money anymore as you used to have. And then after some months or maybe some weeks, and then you begin to have money again, isn't it? Yes. Praise God. There are times when you lost your jobs. And there are times when you got another job. Praise God. You've gone through all this. But what sustains you, what gives you strength? Is the account of God that you have in your life. I believe that's what God wants us to rely upon. Jesus was not bothered by money at all. He just moved from Nazareth. He went to the sea of the, uh, uh, Capernaum. Nobody knew if Jesus has a money on him or anything, nothing. He just went and by himself, near the sea, he began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, that's how it started. Alone, without anything. There's no evidence that he has a house somewhere, he has anything. Nothing, he just started. And then he said, this one, he said, follow me. This one, follow me. There's no promise that this one will eat food as they go. Because Jesus doesn't have a bank account or millions. He doesn't have a house that people are renting and paying him rent every month. That whatever he is, they will collect the rent and bring it. He know nothing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Nothing. The Lord lived by faith from beginning all the way to the end. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Peter and others followed him. Even when he, uh, he told them that, you know, no one can enter the kingdom. No rich man can enter. They all came. They said, we have left everything to follow you. They were conscious that they, you know, they have nothing. But it was not bothered by money. Whether Judas Iscariot was stealing from the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the purse, Christ knew, but that was not his priority. Judas did not repent, and the same sin led him to his downfall. Praise God. So, what is God saying to us? We cannot serve God and money. Our walking with Him should not depend. Our mood, our joy when we come to church. Our happiness in God does not, should not depend on money. How much money we've got in our account. Praise God. Because at the end of a month, you know, you come to church, everybody's working, hallelujah, hallelujah. We shout louder. No problem. 